Um, and yesterday at Kitty Kitty, um, there was some friction around, I must say. Uh, there, was, there was like hopes as people crossed the line, like some fell over on the floor, like right in front of us. And they were like, are you okay? And they're like, yes. Oh, oh, as they like lie on the floor dying. Um, I had some friction that I wasn't, wasn't going to do it anymore. I had paid the money and I'd brought the shoes and done the walk and then I got the COVID, right? Um, I was a little bit disappointed about that until my friends who were staying with us to run woke up and left our house at 4.30 and I left at 6 o'clock. So all that friction that I was feeling about paying the money and doing the training and not running slowly vanished into like just general happiness. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure there was some friction, like some rubs and some blisters on feet. Um, you know, shorts that's, that are great for running normally at like 19 kilometers and then 21. And, oh, they just you get little chaffy bits. Um, I hope all the men that I know uh, wore appropriate T-shirts. Because things can get a bit frictiony, eh? And frictions, this is the point. Things that are just small rubs over now time can lead to great pain. A little bit of rub on the back of your shoe can lead to a blister and, you know, a little bit of friction somewhere on your shirt for your men can lead to some really... Do you want to see the photos? <laughs> well, some of you are pretty gruesome. I promise I actually didn't put any photos up. I was like, no, nah, that's just... It'd be a bit like... That would be a conversation for the AGM, right? <laughs> but in our series about being church together, the aim is to help us avoid some of these really obvious frictions like you're not going to go for a really good 20k run plus run in a pair of jandals this is just not making good sense nor should you probably do them in jean shorts or just no <laughs> and so the aim of this series together is to prevent us from having friction because there are things that you can do beforehand in preparation so it doesn't come to that um, and we've been reminding and refreshing ourselves of, of the things of what it means to be God's people. So we're like putting Vaseline on each other. So when we do come together and we rub up against each other, there's not that. Come on, rub your hands together. <laughs> Friction, right? So last week, if you missed it, there is a really great sermon online from Dave and Bruce slash Caleb. Uh, <laughs> where he talked about what we do when we're having conflict. And I'm not going to preach it again because he already did a way better job than me. And sermons like this are necessary because if we all learn this is what we do when we have conflict, then we all know what to do together. Sermons like this reduces the friction among us because we've put the theory into practice and we're getting tied into that practice. The more we do it, the more we resolve conflicts biblically, the way that Dave outlined in his sermon, the more we get to used to doing it that way, and the more we just don't have to think about it. And we're like, oh man, I might have said something dumb. I'm going to go and talk to them. We can protect ourselves from the friction of being God's people as we work out our theory into practice. And so to this week and next week, we're going to be looking at the book of James. Uh, James is the brother of Jesus, and he kind of carries on this metaphor of being a great running coach. Uh, mixed with well-worn wisdom from the Old Testament, the books of Psalms and Proverbs, we get the story of how to be God's people, because they reckon, they being those biblical scholarly dudes, uh, that James had been a pastor for 20 years. It's like twice as long as I have been, so imagine how much better he would be. Wow. <laughs> and so unlike these little letters that we get in the books of Paul that are like really high theology, Christ is this, he's so amazing. James is like this. The letter of James gets into your business and it challenges how you live. This is not high theology. This is the practical stuff of literally how to be church together. And I would add to this quote that James gets into your business and challenges how you live your life that James is both a challenge and an encouragement. It is a mix of wisdom and of proverbs, of Jesus' own words and this 20 years of experience pastoring a church. So how do we be church together? And what is our hope and some of our expectations? So you can turn to James chapter 1 on your phones or in your Bibles. It's on the back. Don't all rush at once. 
So, <laughs> well done. All right. So we're going to read uh, James 1, 19, just to the end of chapter, which is verse 27. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everything sh everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of any moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and then after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever who looks intently into a perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves righteous and you do, yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And the religion and their religion is worthless. Religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows and those in distress. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the word. Oh, God bless the book of James to us this morning. And while I don't have Dave's uh, four R's from last week, revenge being one of them, Dave, uh, we do have four solid statements here that uh, get start easy and get harder, right? Um, the first one, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And then the last one, I'm like, oh, Holy Spirit, turn up now. So number one. Let's cultivate and continue to cultivate a, dis a discipline of listening to each other well. James says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. How many of you know the, the program The Simpsons? As a bit of a Freudian slip because it's a problem in my mum and dad's house. We weren't allowed to watch it. We were not like the coolest, most bestest program of the whole entire time I was growing up and my parents were like, no. And you get to school and everybody's talking about it and I'm like, oh. And the reason that it wasn't allowed to be watched in my house is because my mum and dad said, this is not the way a loving family and a loving neighborhood should treat each other. And so for those of you who grew up, grew up a bit like me, the, the, the theory is this family, fairly nuclear, um, a mum and a dad, uh, three kids. Uh, the mum the mum is long-suffering and the husband is a bit of a doofus. And much of the hilarity is this, is this ongoing dynamic between a doofus father, a uh, long-suffering mother, and then the pains of like three children who are their own other thing. And the tensions of a lot of this 23-year-old series get down to this. Start off with like, Marge, the mum saying, you're not listening to me. You're only hearing what you want to hear. And then he's like, yeah, thanks, I'd love an omelette. <laughs> there is a whole movie called The Simpsons Movie where the mum tells him to do something and he half pie does it and sets off this massive chain of reactions where the American government end up anyway. It's not that great of a movie. So the book of James would probably be really great for the relationship of the Simpsons, but it probably means that we wouldn't have a 24th season. And James gleans from Proverbs. Proverbs 18, you might have heard. Uh, Proverbs 18, too. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, <laughs> but only expressing his own opinion. Oh, Homer, you're a bit of a fool. Uh, Proverbs 18.13, if one gives an answer before they hear, it is their folly and their shame. Yep, Homer, two out of two so far. So James says, how do we reduce the friction among us? This is the easiest thing we can do as a church, as God's gathered people. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. And there is another great website that you guys might know of if you're a bit handy. 
You can type in anything you could possibly need, and it will give you a step-by-step -step guide. It's called WikiHow. Uh, there is a, a, a guideline about how to prevent foot blisters. Uh, the first step is choose proper footwear. <laughs> and it may seem like common sense, right? Like, make sure your shoe fits so you don't get blisters. But common sense isn't always so common anymore. The book of James is talking about proactive wisdom because maybe wisdom is not so common anymore. And so here, for the sake of everybody, is how WikiHow suggests how to be a good listener. Uh, number one, put away anything that might distract you. Listening to someone requires focus, and it's difficult to focus when you have things that are competing for your attention. Before the person starts speaking, take a moment to put anything away or shut off your cell phone. Ooh. Part two. Face the person and make eye contact with them. Now, there's going to be situations where you're not going to be able to do that. If you're driving down the road, please don't. Okay, number three, suspend any judgment or criticism of what the person is saying. Don't judge what the person says or criticize them in your mind. Just listen to them. Okay? Simple. We've got a couple more slides. Number five. Refocus. If your mind starts to wander, if you're bored by what the person is saying, oh heck, and sometimes even when you're not, your mind may start to wander. This happens. Refocus your mind if it starts to wander. As I said, church, we're starting off easy. We can all listen well to each other. And as we go through, it's going to get harder and harder to the point where we're crying out for God to be in us by his spirit. And even this real simple stuff is helpful because it helps us become slower in our reactions and slower in our responses and slower in our emotions. And as James says, slower to show anger because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Funny that. <laughs> human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger does not produce the right response in God from us that God desires. This is God who tells us, in your anger, so it's fine to be angry, do not sin. And once I probably was half sick and half wagging school when I watched this really great episode of Oprah, and it says when, when we're angry, it's often masking up another emotion. We might be sad or frustrated or fearful. And so if we're slow to react... We can be like, actually, I'm not angry. I'm feeling hurt. And I'm feeling hurt now, so my instant is to lash back out at you. But I'm going to be slow. Because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. Number two, okay, we're getting slightly harder. We're starting to need the gifts of the Spirit among us. Uh, this is the reason that my folks were not fans of The Simpsons. They wanted to remove the hindrances. The second half of the argument went like this. If The Simpsons is not the way a loving family and neighborhood should treat each other, because it's not, we don't need you to see it. Because when you see it, you will start to copy it. And for 23 years, 23 seasons, the show has been on and on, and people have seen their own lives satired in The Simpsons. There is this joke where Homer, the dad, puts his hands around the, his son's throat and chokes him. And we all know that this is not a joke in some people's houses. This is why James says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, if you're anything like me, um, at some point you broke all your non-Christian CDs and promised that you'd never go off Radio Arima or Life FM. You had this moment when you're like, this is all terrible and I don't want to do this stuff and I want to live holy for God. Great. Because this moral filth thing is a big and an expansive definition. It can mean everything to some person and something completely different to someone else. So I'm not going to tell you don't go home and watch The Simpsons. And if you do, don't feel guilty. Nor will you be refused communion if you've had a gin and tonic this week. But be aware of what is out to corrupt you. What is out to corrupt the good of God that is at work in this world. And be aware that slopes can be slippery. 
there may be a good reason for you not to have a gin and tonic, knowing your own battles and knowing your own family history. There might be a good reason why you have internet controls on your Wi-Fi. There might be a good reason for the first thing that you do when your payments come into your bank account is to pay your tithe. Not because God needs your money, but it reminds you that your, this money is a gift from God and not the thing in itself that provides your security. You can see how all of those examples could be slippery slopes. Number three, Jesus take the wheel. Put, your, <laughs> put actions behind your words. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not say what it does is like someone who takes out their cell phone to look at their time and then checks their Twitter and puts it back. This is literally what James is saying. We get distracted and we don't do what we set out to do because we're humans. James is saying, do what you said you will do. If you are following God's law, then follow it. Look at it and live in it well, and it will give you freedom, and it will give you life. From a slightly section, shorter section of Psalm 119, how can a young person, and that's anyone who's not dead, uh, stay on the path of purity? By living according to God's word. The psalmist says, I will seek you with all my heart, and do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your words in my heart that I may not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord, who teaches me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws from your mouth, and I rejoice in following your statutes. As one rejoices in great riches, and I meditate on your precepts, and I consider your ways, and I delight in your decrees, and I will not neglect your word. Church, let's not be people who take out our phones to check the time and then uh, do it four more times. Let's delight ourselves in God. Have his word hidden in our heart. And then from this really lovely place, it will flow from us. Yes, there is an amount of try harder, do better, but it's like this much compared to receive the love that God has given you this much. And in doing what we said we're going to do and remembering what we said God is and seeking and not straying and figuring out in the quiet of your hearts and in the quiet of our hearts together, we hear the word of God as an instruction for us as individuals and a church. And to bring this point home, James says this, those who consider themselves righteous and yet do not keep a right tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. So to hear the word and do it, perhaps it's not the best idea now to go out for lunch with that group of people and where you have this conversation triangle is not you, them and God, but you, them and the person that you saw. Um, I got snapped out on this yesterday. I was having a conversation that wasn't me, that person, and God. It was me, that person, and this other thing that I um, saw over here. Yeah, I got very quickly reminded of it just in time to confess my sin <laughs> in front of the whole church. Because, guys, it takes practice. It takes putting the theory of our faith into the actual practical living out of our words. And to admit that we get it wrong, I confess it was me. And this is the thing, number four, God, I need your help. Remembering that the true essence of religion is humility with God and with others. It's not about looking your best on Sunday morning or pretending to be the perfect person or stuffing everything under the bed when people come over so your house is perfectly clean. Yeah, I know, right? It's currently lots of stuff in, is in our garage. The essence of true religion, number four, is humility before God and with others. To know that where we stand with him is the most important thing. And his love and grace and forgiveness. Religion that our God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after the orphans and the widows in those industries. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the word. As I said, these four points of preparation to help us not have friction start off really easy listen well to each other and finish off really hard 
Remember your place before God because as humans, we want to put ourselves at the top of the pile. We need the Spirit of God with us. Removing hindrances might be okay. You could be able to do it by yourself, but I truly recommend asking the Spirit of God to be with you working through that. Faith in action. This continues to counter the ease of the way that we've historically always done things. Your brain doesn't remember that you brushed your teeth the last 25 years because you've brushed your teeth for the last 25 years, hopefully. It doesn't have to think about it anymore, so it just does it naturally. There are certain things that we need to put away because the natural things we've been doing for the last 20 years are actually harmful and are not remembering that true religion is humility before God and other people. Number four is, though, a dangerous prayer. God, that I may be humble before you and in my humility serve others well. And if we can hear, which I know you all have, welcome to those on Zoom and later on this afternoon on YouTube, but then this is the, this is the tricky bit, church. If we can hear and do if we can follow these four preventions, this is going to help us finish the race without friction. It won't mean that there won't be a little blister or we won't have a little niggle at the end of our kilometers, but it will mean that there are less of them. We will not be sweat-free nor blister-free. There will be still friction as we learn to live ourselves as a church. But this is the stuff we can do. So let's just do it. And for the harder stuff, number two, three, and four from our list, well, here's another clue. Let's look to Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12 gives us this great picture of Christ, who being fully man and fully God, walked a blameless life. We are not yet made perfect but the power of God who raised Christ from the dead is alive and at work in you. So let's do what we can do. And then let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In church, I reckon we could probably run for like 100 miles, maybe 200. Let me pray. God, you are good, and your mercies endure forever. We thank you in the gathering of each of us as your people. You bring us in to be family and to be church one with another. And in that, there are times where we rub. Um, but we thank you for the book of James who gives us practical wisdom about the things that we can do as preventions, the practices and habits that we can learn to make sure that that rubbing is minimal among us. We thank you for the example of Jesus, your son, who lived a perfect life, but not without temptations, and not without instances where he would have gone, oh, goodness me, but yet in his anger did not sin. Help us to fix our eyes on him and be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we may continue to gather well as your people and serve you in humility. Holy Spirit, we need you. I need you. I am yet to be made perfect. But we look forward to the day when we will be, and we will join with many others of multiples and multiples of tongues and races, and we will all sing together, worthy is the Lamb. But until that day, God, be our coach, be our guide, uh, be the Vaseline to prevent the friction among us, we pray. Amen.